As we gather this Saturday morning, grace and peace be unto all of you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. We thank God for this Saturday morning that the Lord has gifted us with uh, the grace of life and strength and health, and we know that it's in him we live and move and have our being. And we thank God that we gather in this place today. Uh, the joy in my heart is overflowing. Uh, just a, about an hour ago, we were downstairs with the homeless outreach, and there were 70 volunteers packing up food, and they're now hitting the streets of D.C. Uh, to bless those who are homeless and hungry. And I thank God to be part of a church to take seriously our commandment to realize that when we feed the hungry, we're actually ministering to Jesus Christ. And so today we pray for them as they're out about in the streets. Um, and thank God for this weekend, of course, as we celebrate the gift that is Martin Luther King Jr. and all that his vision and voice brought to the United States of America and indeed to the world. Um, this is a historic moment uh, that we sit in and gather and we thank God for that. Quickly, how many people have ever been to the Holy Land? Have you ever visited the Holy Land? Very few of us, right? Um, there's no commandment in Christianity, as is in Islam, that we would make a pilgrimage to a holy place. But if ever there was a place that's sacred to Christians, it would be where our Lord and Savior was crucified and resurrected, meaning Israel and Jerusalem. Um, I've taken two trips to Israel. Uh, the very first one, was with a group of church uh, members and we did what all church folk would do, we were tourists. And we visited all the holy and religious sites and saw the supposed place of Calvary and the resurrection, the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and last year, uh, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee uh, sent me on a tour that was much different. It wasn't about touring and just seeing religious sites, it's about understanding some of the political tensions the dynamics that shape that area. For the very first time in my life, I realized um, really how volatile that area is. To visit the West Bank, to go down to the Gaza Strip, to have to be on a bus with armed guards, and to see bomb shelters, it's a much different world than the one in which we live in. And again, I came back with a commitment that um, if we're gonna be global Christians, we have to be aware of those tensions. And so I want to thank you for coming out for part two of this series. Um, on last week, uh, we uh, gathered together and began to talk about all the borders of Israel um, and understanding some of the political issues that are playing themselves out, both historically and in contemporary um, present day. And today we kind of zero in even more on a little bit of the history of Israel to particularly focus on the Israeli-Palestinian problem. Uh, oftentimes we hear about that peace process and the breakdown of it, but very few of us really recognize what the history is and what the real issues are. And so today I'm grateful that you have a curious mind and a, and a heart to want to learn as we come together again. A few words of um, housekeeping as we get ready. Number one, I understand a lot of people in last week uh, had questions about where you can pick up more information. I want to let you know that as a member of Alpha Street Baptist Church, you have the right to have access to a religious theological database called ATLA. Um, ATLA is run through our library, our JOP library, and all you have to do is go online and fill out an application, and uh, Raquel, our librarian, if you'll stand, Raquel, if you have any questions, Raquel can direct you further. That database will give you access to um, articles, studies, research um, on just about every theological subject that you uh, may be curious about, and so if you are interested, that is a resource that's at your disposal, and we I encourage you to do that uh, online. Uh, number two, I ask for you uh, to be patient and prayerful with me. As you see, I'm coaching again, and they got two games again. Uh, it's probably going to go down the same way it did last week. Um, so y'all pray my strength in the Lord. Um, I only got one technical last week. I only got one technical for hollering at the ref. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, prog I'm a work in progress. I'm a work in progress. And then a the final word. Um, um, our presenter, um, again today, we want to welcome back uh, Brother Jonathan Harris. Uh, originally, we were supposed to have a great friend of mine named Asha Afriat, but his daughter is being enlisted in the army in Israel. Um, all citizens have to serve a particular amount of time in Israel, and his daughter's going in, so he's not able to be with us. Uh, but I didn't think we'd have any problem having Brother Harris back, as he did such an awesome and excellent job on last week. Um, he's going to come and present in just a moment, and we thank God for his presence with us. Um, during his presentation, you know, he likes to stop and uh, open up time for question and answer. And 
Uh, in order to really capture all that Mr. Harris is able to teach and present on today, I'm going to ask you a few housekeeping rules. Number one, if you would come to the microphones uh, when you have your questions. Um, and number two, if you uh, can shorten the runway that you use to get to the question, <laughs> would be greatly appreciated. Um, and, and I say that laughingly, but we don't need a biographical sketch before you give us the question that you have. Thank God you lived here and you've seen that and you've worked there. That, that's great, but can you get to the heart of the matter so that I think all of us get a little, you know, a little rustled when folk get up and you just keep saying, get to it, get to it, get to it. So if you would, I'm saying that publicly so that when Dr. Gunn enforces it, you won't be upset. Uh, we want to get right to the heart of the matter so that we can continue to move on and be out of here at 12, having received all that Mr. Harris can present to us. Would you bow with me in prayer and then we begin our journey on today. In your word, O oh God, you tell us that the peacemakers shall be called your children. We take seriously our charge to be peacemakers, not only in our lives, but in our world. To be peacemakers, we have to understand the cause of division and tensions and war. So today, in an attempt to be a peacemaker, we gather with hungry and thirsty minds that we might understand the tensions that play themselves out in Israel the land which your son was born and died, which we root our faith in. We ask today that you would guide and govern our time in this place, uh, that you would strengthen our presenter on today as we thank you for all that you've done in his life, that he might be a vessel used by you to bless us on this day. We thank you, Lord, for what we're about to receive. We begin our journey now under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. amen. Would you welcome back Brother Jonathan Harris as he gets ready to start today. Thank you very much. Everybody can hear me. I guess I got a hot mic. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you very much. I had a joke I was going to say about the, the question and answer. Uh, it's the famous line, the Alex Trebek line, you know, make sure your question is in the form of a question. Uh, there's lots of people that stand up at these things and they, and, uh, and they, and they want to tell me everything they know, and that's great. And it, look, I don't want to shut anybody down. Some of that stuff is very, very important to hear. So, but I also do, we do have to move through this uh, quickly. So uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate what the pastor said. Um, so we're going to get into this right away. Um, this is going to be Israel-Palestine. We're going to have to go back. We're going to do like two sections. So we're going to do like a historical section that I'm going to try to get us all the way up to 1993, which was the beginning of the Oslo process. And the Oslo, we'll talk more about what Oslo was. But Oslo was sort of the beginning of the true modern-day peace process uh, really began in 1993, and everything up until that point was was uh, working out the fact that these two people actually had to, these two groups of people actually had to enter a peace process. Um, and 1993 was when that actually took place. Um, so, but everything up into that 1993 is important, and it, it colors a lot of the thinking. It colors a lot of the, the um, what's happening in, in the region even now. And I think in the beginning here, what we're going to talk about is really some of the biblical roots of this. This is a biblical uh, study, after all. And um, so we are going to touch a little bit on the biblical roots of this conflict. There is, there is a biblical root here um, that, that is part of this, is a kernel in the backstory of all of this that underlies everything and definitely affects the way the people in the region actually address these issues and address this and why it is an emotional issue, why it is a religious issue. That's, that's there too, and we're going to talk about that. So let's just start with the slides here. I actually have a pointer today, which is a very fun thing to have. So what you've seen, what we all have seen read many times in Genesis, of course, is God's covenant with Abraham, the you shall be the father of many nations, I will establish my covenant, I will give to you and your descendants all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, I will be their God. This is, of course, the core of uh, the Jewish claim to the land. Um, it goes back to this. Uh, this is something that is still revered today. Uh, not just by Jews, obviously, but by Christians, by Muslims. This is a very important statement, um, very important core uh, belief uh, in the hearts and minds of many people in the region, and they, they do claim to this, uh, cling to this, and it is important, and it's certainly important for us to understand that this, these texts are not forgotten. They, they live and breathe today just as they did then. So uh, we'll go to the next slide. We're going to talk a little bit about these kinds of questions. So if Abraham was the precursor and, and the, his descendants are to inherit the land, who are his descendants? 
Um, what is the land of Canaan? To whom should the land belong? What authority does such a promise made 4,000 years ago have today? And these are all the issues. I'm not going to necessarily answer these questions. I want you to remember that these are the questions that, that drive a lot of the dialogue even today and drive a lot of the way that emotional reactions are today to the land, to the place we're talking about, to the holy land. Um, there is a lot of emotion. There is a lot of this because of these sorts of questions that are, that are huge questions for believers of various faiths. These are enormously important questions. Okay, so go to the next. So we have these. This, this is the biblical narrative. Very quickly, God promised Abraham he would have a son, but Sarah, his wife, was 77 years old, so Sarah suggested that he have a son through her maid, Hagar. As we know, this is the, the Ishmael story. So go on to the next. So we have Hagar having Ishmael, Abraham with Sarah not having. Hagar was born first uh, through, the, through the maid. Go to the next. And then 13 years later, and he said he would then bless Sarah with a child. So go to the next. And then we see how Ishmael, Isaac. So now we have the Arab tradition, which follows the Ishmael side, and the Jewish tradition following the Isaac side. And I know this is a biblical story. I know what it means in, in Christianity. It's, it's an important story. But in, in these two faiths, in the Judaism faith and the faith of Islam, these are monumentally important core stories. It's, it's very seriously, it drives a lot of the, of the emotion behind these things. And, and so I don't want to, I, I want to put it right up front here to show that this is part of the grounding and part of the, the tension actually goes clear back to these sort of texts, these sort of promises that we see in the Bible. So go to the next. I will bless Ishmael and make him fruitful, and he shall be the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation, but I will establish my covenant with Isaac. And Ishmael is sent to do his thing and have his tradition, and Isaac will be the tradition of the covenant with the people of Israel. So go to the next. He offers his son. Now this is an interesting where, where the traditions actually have a break. This is kind of one, of these, one of these places where it's actually, there's actually a break in the tradition where Different traditions interpret this same story very different ways. Muslim believe it was Ishmael that was going to be sacrificed. Okay? And that is tradition they hold, that Isaac was not the one, that it was the first son that was going to be, going to be uh, and that the dream had his dream uh, on the rock was the same rock then that Muhammad uh, went to heaven from on his night journey that's in the Quran. You'll hear more about that next week. So go to the next one. And then this became this site where this rock was and also where Isaac was going to be sacrificed, that area, that is now the area revered by Jews as where the temple of Solomon was built, where the threshing floor of David was purchased. Okay, all of this was on Mount Moriah. Okay, and Muslim believes that on the night journey of Muhammad, he went to visit this place. It is in, in the Quran, is, it is listed as Al-Aqsa or the last, the farthest mosque. Okay, but that is held to be Jerusalem, Al-Quds, the holy. And now that is covered, that rock is covered by the Dome of the Rock that was built in the uh, 7th century, late 7th century. So all this, you see how this place, this one specific place, in fact, I, having been in that Dome of the Rock, and, and maybe you were able to go there as well, it's a small rock. A rock maybe would take up this altar right here. Okay, that's it. And all of this, all of these competing traditions place this much meaning, this much power, this much substance into this one place, this 10 by 10 foot area, okay? So it's, it's profoundly important how, how this resonates, that if you're, it's not just the land, it's not just all that, it's the meaning of a very specific place can, can change how diff all these people interpret different things and what they're actually giving up, okay, can change based on what kind of meaning they give it. So go to the next. Now, this is, again, following this break just a little bit, I'm not going to go too far into this, but I want to show that just as um, we see that the tradition in, the, in Judaism is that Mount Moriah was the place, well, in Islam it is Ishmael and Abraham building the Kaaba that is in Mecca and so on. They have their tradition of what Abraham did with Ishmael. Okay. So that is also this, it's this competing tradition, and it starts to divide, and it, starts to, and it continues to divide. So go to the next. So 
all this area here, this is why this is so important and, and why the Al-Aqsa Mosque or the last mosque at the, the Jerusalem Mosque in, in, uh, on the Temple Mount is so important because it is connected to this, or this tradition. It is connected to this, the uh, Muslim tradition and it, is, it does make Jerusalem holy within that tradition just as it makes it holy to the Jews. So it's, it's, it's very important that these traditions, you see they, they break apart, but they're all talking about the same territory, the same basic area of space. This is obviously going into, uh, farther into the Islamic tradition, but I wanted to show that, to show that these traditions, they, they have their parallels and, they have, and, they, but they, and they're both moving forward. Go ahead. So now we look at this and we see how Christianity, of course, Jesus grafted in Jewish, from the Jewish people and how these all connect and how and why in America we can now we can see from this why there is this more natural affinity of Christians with the Jewish tradition than the Islamic one because it's closer. It's not as far off the branch as the Islamic tradition is. Islamic tradition is from Ishmael and the, the Christian tradition and Jewish tradition are both from the Isaac branch. Okay, so that's, that's part of why there is this natural affinity there. Okay, go to the next. So, this is just to show that this has been the, the, the this is where this whole story played out. I just wanted to have this up here just to show. This is where this entire narrative, the entire narrative of the Jewish people, the entire narrative of, of their going from Canaan down into Egypt, 400 years of slavery, and then back, all of this played out right in this area, right on this stage, okay, over a 400-year period, 450-year period. Okay, go to the next. These are where the 12 tribes basically settled. This is a biblical map, not an archaeological one, but this is basically the tradition where these tribes were based on what the Bible said. This is the basic outlines of where the tribes settled and in the conquest of Joshua and uh, the conquest of the land of Canaan. So this is just to show that this is still, this is now, this is when the Jews have come back. The Jewish people, the Hebrews have come back and they've resettled the land that was given to them by, Ab given under Abraham. This is around, this is, by the way, this is occurring around the 11th century uh, BC. Next. So we have the Israelite kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of David and Solomon, okay? So David ruled from around 990 to 968. Again, this is best, best archaeological understanding and best uh, historical understanding. His son, King Solomon, expanded the kingdom greatly um, into the, the outer boundaries you see there. And the red line you see there is the present-day state of Israel. So keep this in mind, how much that is the same place. It's really right on top of the other one, okay? And we're going to get into that more when we talk about the West Bank and, and Judea and Samaria because that's really uh, part of the, one of the major, major stumbling blocks to the whole peace process. And then we have in 722, of course, the Assyria destroying the northern half of the kingdom. The other half of the kingdom, the lower half, Judah, survives up until 586 B.C. And that is, by the way, um, why Jews are today called Jews because they are tribe of Judah, okay, it's Judea, that all came from that one tribe that survived that first onslaught, the tribe of Judah was the surviving tribe after the first, the top northern ten tribes were basically conquered by Assyria. Judah survived for another 150 years, and so that came to emblemize all the Jewish people and the entire faith, really, of Judaism came out of that tribe of Judah. So, next. And then we, this is what I kind of did last week as well, just to show you that empire after empire after empire controlled this area and swept over it, added its layer of culture, and then continued on. But certainly, uh, the Roman Empire was a major one um, that certainly left a lasting, lasting impact, even changing the name of the area. So we'll get to that too. So go to the next. So under Rome... Uh, Pompey basically conquered the area in 63 B.C. It was going to be set up as a province, and then they decided not to, and they set up, decided instead of setting up a province, they would set up like a petty kingdom where they would appoint a king. And so they found King Herod. Herod was an Idumean. He was a convert to Judaism, okay? But he was someone that uh, Mark Antony trusted, 
and thought he could do the job, so he was basically put in charge, and then and he w allied with Antony in the, in the war with Antony and uh, Augustus, uh, Octavian. Uh, Antony lost, but Herod, being a shrewd guy, went right to Octavian and said, I'll work for you. <laughs> uh, you won, so I'll work for you. And, and he was convincing enough, Herod was a shrewd man, and he convinced Octavian to leave him in the job. So Octavian renewed his kingship, and he was stayed in the kingship until 4 BC when he died. So, and after his death, it was divided up under his sons and, and nephew and, and brother. So, but this is the time period that kind of sets the stage for when Jesus, the lifetime of Jesus, so it gives you an idea. This, this area was in a process of being Romanized. It wasn't a full Roman province, but that was, it was on its way. Okay, it was in that sort of quasi moving from, from kingdom to Roman province. So, go to the next. So we have Jesus crucified in Jerusalem, put to death. Many of the Christian holy sites, including the tomb of Virgin Mary, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Most of the architecture you see here, by the way, is Crusader period. That's how late this is. But the same site was still that site. So this site, these sites have been revered since the second century, maybe the third century. Um, and, but what you're seeing there is what, when the Crusaders came and retook the city uh, in the 11th century, they basically had to rebuild the churches because they'd gone into such disrepair. So most of the architecture you see here is Crusader period, but still, you know, 800 years old, so not like built yesterday. So, uh, and the tomb of the Virgin Mary is a beautiful site, and, and I encourage you all to go there, and there are two more tombs of the Virgin Mary you can visit. Um, <laughs> Uh, one in, one in uh, Turkey in Ephesus and, and one in southern France. So uh, maybe, maybe, maybe all of them need a visit. I don't know. But it sounds like a pretty good tour. So uh, anyway, just keep in mind, I'm, I'm saying this a little bit of humor because, look, the archaeology, for, I, I did archaeology in Israel for a couple years, and I will say that some of the archaeology for these sites is extremely good and some of it is less good, Okay. So take it with a, a grain of salt, and, and it's still, it still can be a fascinating, fascinating thing to look at. So go to the next. So we have the destruction of Jerusalem and Israel, uh, in the first, and we have the first Jewish revolt uh, against Rome, destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 CE. This was immediately after, this was basically the wall, the farthest northern wall of Jerusalem was being built by the, by the, the descendants of Herod, basically, um, was finished in 67 and in 70, the legion showed up and took the city. <laughs> so almost immediately after this, this wall was finished, and that, that was seen as kind of the last affront to Rome that Rome was going to put up with, they invaded and took, and took the city and, and leveled the city. Um, the Second Jewish Revolt uh, basically took place in 132. This is a revolt under a guy named Bar Kopka, um, who was uh, uh, a Jewish partisan who raised a revolt and may or may not have actually secured Jerusalem. We don't know. There were some coins made that seemed to claim that he had made, you know, he'd captured the city, but we don't actually know if that actually was achieved or not, or that was just wishful thinking on a coin. But uh, either way, it was retaken by 135 by Hadrian, who was at that time the most powerful emperor the Roman had ever had. So, and, and then... Hadrian died pretty quick after that, but he basically took the city, renamed it after himself, renamed the entire uh, area, the entire province, the Judea part was stripped out, and it was named after the Philistines as a way to completely eradicate the Jewish presence there. Hadrian had a real difficulty. Hadrian was very Hellenized. He was also probably gay. He, or at the time, that wasn't that unusual. You could have a wife and also have uh, men uh, that would go with you everywhere sort of thing. Uh, he was very Greek. He was very uh, Hellenized. And he was very, very offended, like deeply offended by the Jewish faith. He felt it to be uh, truly horrible that they would not eat pork. Pork was the preferred meat of the empire at the time. That was horrible. The fact they wouldn't eat with non-Jews in some cases on certain holy days and things like that. This whole idea of uncleanliness really offended him. And by far, what offended him the most was circumcision. This, considered, this was considered a, a horrible mutilation 
and he couldn't handle it. And so he had this really personal feeling against the Jews. He was a true, true, deep anti-Semite, and he wanted to eradicate them. This was this is exactly what he wanted to do. And so when they took that in 135, it was a, it was a very fierce attack. It was very much about eradicating that that culture, okay, destroying the temple completely, leveling it, throwing it all down. Uh, Roman armies were very good at destroying things, and they made they made a quick work of this. Now, interestingly, from an archaeological perspective, they did rebuild the city and garrison it, and but the capital was moved to Caesarea, and that was made the Roman capital. But Jerusalem was garrisoned with with a cohort of a legion, and much of that architecture that was built after. Um, Hadrian, that's still there. We find a lot of the Roman ruins and things are actually still in Jerusalem, and that's what you'll see when you go. You'll see a lot of the Roman city and the Roman streets and things like that have been excavated. So it's actually quite fascinating that that, that time period that was so complete in its in its takeover and its kind of smashing of the of that city that the Roman stuff is now kind of layer one when you go back because everything before that was really was really destroyed. So the Roman layer is oftentimes the earliest layer you can find. Now, we have found some places where, we, where it's deeper, but the Roman layer is dominant. So Jews were forbidden to live in Jer Jerusalem, and Judea was renamed Palestine, as it says here. This Arch of Titus in Rome was completed in 81, so 11 years after the destruction of the temple. And you can see the Roman soldiers carrying the menorah from the temple. That was some of the temple, uh, and it was still this, even then, see, even in 81 AD, it was still this icon of the Jewish people, the menorah. Okay, it was still understood, but anyone who walked by that understood, oh, that's the conquest of Judea. Okay, it, it was the Roman bragging, and Titus was the Roman, he was the general that took it, he then went and became emperor, but at the time when he took the city, he was just the general in charge of taking the city. That's why it's the Ark of Titus. Okay, go to the next. So after that happened, there were certainly Jews that stayed. There were certain small enclaves, not probably in Jerusalem as much, but certainly in the outside of the old city, the, the city walls, there were Jews that stayed, and Jews that stayed in other parts of what is now Israel. But Jews also fled across the Mediterranean and scattered. And this is known as the diaspora or the dispersal. Okay? And this is a very big thing in, in Judaism today, um, working, talking about the diaspora, it's, there's a whole diaspora studies uh, school of thought uh, in Judaism about where this took people and where the, why they went there versus here and, and what happened to them and how it changed them as they went there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but this is where you get all these synagogues uh, built all over the Mediterranean world and so on and so forth. So it's an, it's, an, it's an amazing time in Jewish history, but it was also brought about by a real tragic time uh, with, the, with the temple's destruction. So go to the next. So now we're jumping way ahead. <laughs> we're going ahead because there's just a series of empires that, go, that I don't want to get into again, but I want to come back to this and look at just the Ottoman Empire under Suleiman because this is where we start to get into modern-day Israel, modern-day uh, Palestine. So we look at this, this territory here. This is what was controlled under Suleiman the Magnificent in 1580. Uh, Jerusalem fell to the to Ottoman Turks in 1517. So from 1517 to 1923, 1923, 1922, basically that period of time, for that almost that entire period of time, there was a few fluctuations in there between with with sort of uh, little fiefdoms that would be created. But basically that that entire period of time, Jerusalem is under Ottoman rule or Turkish rule, okay, and so that culture really imprinted on that. The walls you see when you go to see the old city today were built in 1535. They're Turkish walls, okay? The temple that you see, the temple walls that you see around the Temple Mount, most of that's Turkish. They, they reconstructed the temple uh, up to its current level. Stuff like this. Repairers, things like this. So go to the next. So now we're going to go jump to modern Jewish history. I want to kind of lay this out again and do the biblical part, but now we're going to do this. What has been happening with the Jews? How did this come about? Because as you saw there, the Jews, for by and large, for, there were small Jewish communities in Israel this entire time. There's no doubt about it. But the vast majority of the Jewish people left, were scattered. Okay. So what brought about their return? What brought about them to come back? How did this happen? How was this affected? So let's look at. Go to the next slide. 
So what had been happening over the hundreds and hundreds of years in Europe and was only getting worse was this really, really serious rise in anti-Semitism and this fear of the Jews, mysticism surrounding the Jewish people, all those kinds of things. Um, lots of forced conversions and baptisms, uh, public disputations, like them being embarrassed, having all their money taken away. It was a very common thing in the Middle Ages for a king who ran out of money to just seize all the Jews, take all their stuff, and take them out. And in 50 or so years, or 10 years or so, you let them all back in, and in 10 years, you do it again. This was this was this common occurrence because they were the persecuted because they were the non-Christians, okay? They were persecutable, okay, by most European powers, and this continued and it and it it really became quite quite intensive uh, into the nineteen in the eighteen hundreds and nineteen hundreds. Um, we really see it, and certainly in the eighteen hundreds, um, toward the end of the eighteen hundreds, it became it really reached a fever pitch in Europe, where Jews became truly hated by the majority of Europeans. And it, they beca it became dangerous to be in Europe at times and in places. So we saw, we see massive pogroms or these raids where they would just massacre entire towns. Um, things like this would happen more and more and more. And this became um, just unsustainable. Something had to be done. And certain countries became aware that something had to be done. And this all came to a head around World War I. So go to the next. So this is what was happening during all this time. In 1290, the expulsion of Jews. 1306, expulsion of Jews in, in France. Spain, 1492. Portugal, 1497. All this being expelled. And so pushed, pushed, pushed. Most of it ended up in Eastern Europe, north of the Ottoman Empire, north of Hungary, all that. Pushed, pushed, pushed. And then they would resettle once they were pushed into these, uh, the yellow areas. Okay, so those became the dominant areas of Jewish people. So they became dominant in Germany, for instance, and things like this, because they were being pushed from someplace else and had to move. And this was just constant. This was the story of the, for the medieval world for the Jews. Okay, go to the next. So during this time, there started, in the 1800s, we first start to see this concept of, now, I want to back up and say, throughout Jewish history, there has always been a tradition, a sort of, romance with the land of Israel, okay, throughout all this time that I just described here, all this, this persecution time, there was always this romance with, let's go return to the land of Israel, the land of our fathers, but it was never real, it was never seen as something that might actually happen, they just, they didn't have any power, they had no political power, no legal power, so what was going to happen, no one knew, but, the, but it started to become real in the 1800s, in the 1800s, Britain for lots of different reasons, but Britain started to wake up to the idea that the Jewish people maybe did have a claim to that part of, of the land. And Britain was already a major player in, in Egypt and was leaning into and, was, and saw the entire area that was, that was now modern Israel as a very, very um, open part of the Ottoman Empire. The, the, the Ottoman Empire really didn't have much uh, presence there. And so Britain and France both looked on that area, Syria, Lebanon, what is now Syria and Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine territory. Uh, all that area there was seen as sort of ripe for something. And Britain was looking, looking on it with, with a gimlet eye, if you will. So this is when also we started to see the Jewish people who had been persecuted start to find their way there in various ways, various methods, and we'll get into that more. But there started to be a slight, slight, slight uptick in Jews moving to the, this area, the Holy Land, and actually trying to live there. That just really started to return. Now, again, as I said, there were always small Jewish communities there, very small. But now this started to rise in the 1800s. We started to see actual communities moving from Europe and resettling in that area. So that starts. And we see things like this mixed agricultural school in 1870. And this town, Petah Tikva, founded in 1880. These are small, small little Jewish communities that are founded in this time because of new immigrants coming to that area for the first time. And a lot of this was Jewish philanthropists, um, wealthy Jews in various who had achieved some sort of stability and wealth and protection would sponsor these things and like and sponsor a, a, a whole uh, bunch of homes or or a town or whatever and to try to do this to try to return the people to the land. This started to become 
a, a movement, but it wasn't, it didn't really have a leader yet. It was just kind of this, this beginning of an idea. So go to the next. So this started to grow because, and I may have actually dropped a slide there, I'm sorry. Uh, so a man actually is a, is a, plays a huge role in this, a particular man um, named by name of Theodore Herzl. Theodore Herzl was a Austrian reporter, journalist, who witnessed the Dreyfus trial uh, that went on in, in France in 1895. In 1895, um, a Jewish man was wrongly accused of, of something and was going to be executed, of being a spy and was going to be executed. And uh, Theodore Herzl was there covering it as a reporter and saw these massive crowds chanting death to the Jews. And he had never been, been had never had seen that in Austria. So this was, a, this was, a, this was a kind of an eye opener for him about how bad it had gotten, how serious it had become. The, the hatred of Jews, the anti-Semitism in Europe had become so bad and Dreyfus was eventually pardoned, but it, the Dreyfus affair, as it became known, showed how far Europe had come into this anti-Semitic thought and how widespread it was and how vicious it was. So um, all of this came to a head with, with Theodore Herzl writing a book called, and kind of articulating for the first time the idea of a Jewish state. And he wrote a book called The Jewish State. And, it, and he actually defined the idea of wanting a Jewish homeland and, and agitating for a Jewish homeland in Palestine or maybe somewhere else, but that was usually the, the, the target area, as Zionism. This was his word. Zion was, a, was an old term for the state of Israel, for the land of Israel, Zion, the land of Zion. And so he used that term to show that this was a, a Jewish nationalist movement. That's really what it was. It was Jewish nationalism. Just like any other nationalism, they had a right to their own country, so the Jews should have a right to their country, too. This was how this came about. Uh, Herzl was not religious. He was secular. He was assimilated. Um, and he, but he felt like the Jews were really in danger, and they needed to have a, a, a land of their own. So this is where, he came, where this started. And it took hold. It actually took hold very rapidly. And in 1897, there was that, because a lot of Jews around the world had started to realize this was a very real problem, and so by 1897, there is a World Zionist Congress, and they have had their first conference in Switzerland, and so on and so forth. It actually took hold very quickly uh, internationally uh, in the Jewish community. And there was this desire to establish something. And the, co the government that was most, most receptive to this idea was Britain. Britain at that time was very religious. It had, had a sort of religious revival of a sort. It had also had a new revival in, in an interest in the Holy Land. Uh, a group of royal engineers had gone to Palestine in the 1880s and 1890s, and they'd surveyed the entire country. Literally like four guys and some donkeys and a chain and the whole thing. These royal marines had dragged this chain all over the, all over the uh, Palestinian territory and measured everything, written down everything they'd seen, looked at everything, drew everything. They were royal engineers, that's what they did. And they made an archaeological record, or an architectural record, of the entire Palestinian area. And this thing became famous. It's, it, it started a, a complete a fascination with the Holy Land in England. And interestingly, that entire project of those royal engineers was all sponsored by churches. It wasn't sponsored by the government. So this kind of married this, these two things together for the first time, the idea of a Christian Zionist uh, effort or, or Christian effort in the Holy Land with this idea with the same country that was suddenly just rediscovering the Holy Land itself. So we'll go to the next. So after World War I, uh, or this is World War I, so we have this situation where Turkey and the Ottoman Empire almost reluctantly, but for, for reasons we're not going to get into now, basically sided with the, the side who lost. Okay? Uh, they had a relationship with Germany, and that was what pulled them in, but they really probably could have stayed neutral, and they chose not to. They didn't stay neutral, and so they lost. And so the Ottoman Empire basically went bankrupt uh, in the process of World War I, and so all the territory they controlled was then pretty much handed over to the allies who won World War I, and the USA really wasn't in a position to do anything about the Middle East, and Britain and France were, so Britain and France sort of got the job. But in the post-Ottoman Empire, it was Britain and France who were, who were in charge of it. 
I'm going to be in charge of dividing it up and seeing where it went and who got what and all that. Okay, so that's how that started. And it all came out of the, in, the end of uh, the end of World War One. Go to the next. So this is what they did, and this is known even today. It's it's definitely a, a phrase to remember: the Sykes Pico Agreement, because basically it's now a hundred years old, almost, and it's coming apart as we see as we look at the Middle East right now. Basically, what we're looking at right now is the end of the Sykes Pico Accord, but. But we'll get to that in a minute. But what I want to show you here is this is what they decided. This was basically the French and the British foreign ministers sat down and carved up the Middle East. Okay? And they didn't do it based on religion. They didn't do it based on actual it, tribes on the map or anything like that. They did it based on their interests. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so uh, if you want to know why there's a whole lot of very strangely uh, apportioned nations in the Middle East, this is the origin of it, okay? This is why we have a, these all these countries that are so badly uh, cobbled together is because they were really done uh, at the stroke of a pen uh, by European powers a hundred years ago. So that's not the only reason there are problems, but it's one of the reasons there are problems. So this did, however, fix the southern border of the Palestine. There you'll see where it, the border of Egypt uh, and uh, that line there. That is still the border today, so some of these borders did survive. Um, but basically, this, is, this was really, really based on spheres of influence and really based on European interests and European desires. It really, they didn't really care as much about what, was re the, what the reality was on the ground. Now, the powers that were there sort of went along. The families, there were rich families, rich Arab families, just went along with this because they needed that Western legitimacy to enter into the modern post-World War I world, or they felt they did. Okay, so and there were different agreements. The Arabs had agreed to help the British in this way, and so they got this. And the this Arab family helped to help the French in this way, so they got this, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, on down the line, it was all orchestrated and all kind of parcelled out to the people who had helped the British and the French in World War One. And those families were not necessarily friendly to the idea of a Jewish state in Palestine. Okay, so here's where the problem begins. So go to the next. So here's Britain's agreement with the Arabs in 1916. They promised the Sheriff of Mecca, who, who was an important, power, important person at the time, that these districts would be this, this would be this, this would be this, as you can read there. Okay? This is what he, de he declared. Homs, Hama, Aleppo, those are all parts of Syria now. All this was what was promised this, in this agreement. Now, do you think, reading this, that that included what we consider now to be Palestine or the state of Israel? the modern state of Israel, those territories. Okay, go to the next. Did this include Palestine? Did the area to be included, excluded from the Arab control include the Sanjak of Jerusalem? So these areas excluded. Sanjak, which just means like district, and Viliet, which means like province or, or state um, of Beirut, in other words, Palestine. The Arabs said, no, those are not excluded. The British said, yes, they are. <laughs> and the British were in charge. So what happened was the British said in 1922, yes, this is actually something different. We're going to rearrange this. We're going to do it differently. And at this same time was when the League of Nations was formed. And so the League of Nations now had to decide how this is going to be parceled out and declare a final status on this. Okay, so go to the next. So then we have the Balfour Declaration, which came in the, kind of in, the, in, the, in this process. I want to include it here in its entirety. So this is the, this is the de declaration of the British government in 1917, November of 17. So World War I is not quite over, but it seems like it's going the way the British want. And they want to basically, first of all, they want Jewish money. Okay, that's part of it for their war. They want to actually have U.S. Jews helping bring the United States into the war to help Britain because Britain could tell they probably couldn't win without U.S. help, or it was going to drag on for more years. They would win eventually, but it would drag drag on. So there was lots of reasons for the Balfour Declaration, but one of the reasons was it was very popular in Britain. This was extremely popular, this idea of Britain granting the Jewish people a homeland. This was very popular. It was a win-win for the British government at that time. Now it says they're a national home for the Jewish people, and the other caveat Nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. In other words, 
They had to buy the land. Okay? They could go, and we'll help them establish that, but they had to buy it, they had to pay for it, it has to be legal. That was the arrangement. Okay? And so this is the way it worked. So go to the next. So this is how they did it. The British were given control of, of Palestine by the Versailles Conference in 1919. And Faisal, Faisal was one of the, there was two Arab, large Arab camps here. And Faisal was the leader of a camp who said, we can work with the Jews. Okay? They were the moderates. And they were the, they were the camp that said, yes, we'll sign a deal, we'll work together, we'll establish you know, sort of a, a joint community, it'll be great. And Weissman, who was the head of the Zionist Conference at the time, said, okay, and they signed this agreement. And said, we will divide up this territory equally, we'll work it together, we'll establish towns together, et cetera, et cetera. This was the idea. All that fell apart because the League of Nations gave Britain the mandate to administer an established Jewish homeland. This is important. In the 1920 charter that was, by the way, unanimously confirmed by all 51 members of the League of Nations, okay, all 51 signed this agreement, said, this state that you see there, that entire area, Palestine, Eretz Israel, Jewish national home, British mandate, was created to give the Jews a national state. That entire spot, okay, in 1920, and it, it explicitly said in that charter that this, that you should facilitate, the British government needs to facilitate and encourage Jewish immigration to this state, okay? This was part, this was British policy now, British national policy. And, and all the League of Nations, again, all 51 members signed it. Okay, go to the next. Now, in 1921, Britain changed its mind. <laughs> this happens a lot. So, in 1921, Britain stopped Jewish settlement in Transjordan, the opposite side of the East Bank, if you will, of the Jordan, and gave that to an Emir Abdullah, who later became the first king of Jordan. Why did they do that? Because he had been one of the guys they had promised stuff to in World War I. And they had to pay him off. They had to, they had to placate him. Because, one of the reasons this happened was because this Arab kingdom of Syria was collapsing. That was this French kingdom we talked about last week. That was cr crumbling and falling apart and turning into this huge Arab revolt. And so Britain needed to do something to placate and so not have Palestine erupt into the same thing and just completely come apart. So they very quickly decided, okay, we're going to give that part to this other Arab state and create a buffer and, and kind of and, and play one off the other and et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So that happened in 1921. By 22, it's a, it's a done deal. The Jews that had accepted the other agreement and the Balfour Declaration and the 1916 thing, all that, all that, that was ignored. Britain just did it. Okay, they just, they just cut it off. And this, by the way, the Jews were not allowed to, they were, they were forbidden to move into that area, the, the Transjordan, the New Jordan area. That was, by the way, 77% of the total that had been granted them in the beginning. Okay. So 77% of the so-called Jewish national home that existed for exactly one year on a piece of paper was now gone. Oh, so, so this here was taken away, and that equals, this gray section equals 77% of what had been promised only a year previous, okay? And this was what was left. And again, it, that was seen to be a future home for the Jews. It wasn't even majority Jewish yet, it was just, but, but the British had a mandate to encourage Jewish settlement and to, and to help them settle there, okay? That was where we were in the 20s. So go to the next one. Now, here's where we start to see the rise of a Palestinian nationalism and a Palestinian Arab nationalism, okay? Now, keep in mind, at this time, I'm, I'm using this term Palestinian kind of anachronistically because at this time, if you would have said, if in the 20s, if you would have referred to a Palestinian, they would have thought you were speaking about a Jew, okay, a Jew from that area, okay. Arabs from that area did not call themselves Palestinian. They called themselves Arabs, okay. And Syrians called themselves Syrians. Jordanians called themselves Jordanians or Arabs, okay. They were not, there, was, there wasn't this idea of a Palestinian Arab identity yet. But this is the genesis of it. And... Importantly, it was not a good development for anybody, including the state of Israel, but also even the Arabs. It really, it really 
truncated something that was working. Remember that Faisal Weitzman thing? That all got ripped apart by this. So, Muhammad Amin al Husseini was a convicted anti-Jewish writer. He was basically a proto-terrorist. Uh, he didn't really have a political agenda other than anti-Jewry, so I won't call him a terrorist, but that's basically what he was. And he, um, he was made Grand Mufti, despite the opposition of the Muslim High Council, but he was just very popular as like a kind of a, a thug uh, of, the, of, the, of the region, and he was able to secure the position. Uh, he eliminated Arab, he killed, he assassinated all kinds of Arabs that supported him, and including the moderates. He basically ran the moderates out and took over the sort of Arab agenda for that area. Okay, he was um, a revolutionary. He constantly, constantly started revolts against the British. He he had massacres against against Jewish towns, Hebron in twenty nine and others. But he poisoned Palestinian relations all the, even to now. Hussein is just Al Husseini is really really a bad actor in this whole phenomenon, and really wrecked what was what possibly could have been a joint project between Arabs and Jews. Was, was completely destroyed by him, by his active, active uh, effort. And that was his goal, by the way. That was his, his stated goal, was to prevent this from happening, prevent this Jewish state from ever forming in any way, shape, or form. He was also uh, very much in bed with the Nazis and would eventually meet Hitler and all this. I mean, he was, he was a true anti-Semite, uh, died in the wool. So go to the next. Yeah, this is just a little bit more on him, and, and I wanted to, you know, drive this home a little bit. Um, he was very much a part of, uh, uh, in the whole thing with Hitler. There's a picture of him meeting with Hitler, um, and he, he, Yasser Arafat was Hussein's nephew, which we can get, talk about that too. But there was definitely this sense that he had really bought into this whole idea of exterminating the Jews. The Jews were the problem. The Jews had to be eradicated. We have to do it any way we can, et cetera, et cetera. Now, he failed. He fell out of power. It, he didn't. He didn't, but when he, and he died soon, not too long after this, but he was a deep part of this all and a, a deep part of the problem that actually made that initial break uh, between uh, the Jewish and Arab projects of that time. Okay? So go to the next. So Britain now has this conundrum to deal with. It has promised the Jews these things, and they wanted unlimited immigration to Palestine to escape persecution in Europe. And they, when, they, when the Britain wouldn't let them do that, when, they tried, when Britain tried to curtail the immigration, Jewish groups reacted violently and verbally abusive to the Brits. Arabs opposed Jewish immigration as they saw it would lead to a Jewish majority, which of course it was going to, and so they attacked Britain for allowing it, for allowing any immigration. So now Britain is sitting on this, on this mandate and they've got both constituencies inside fighting each other and hating them. Okay, and both constituents see the Britain as the problem, as the, as the power that is actually aiding the other. In reality, Britain was just caught in the middle of all this. So go to the next. This was the problem. There were British Zionists, like I talked about, the ones who sponsored this, this Royal Engineers tour, um, and there were British Arabists who didn't like Jews and didn't want the Jews there and didn't think they had a right to the land, et cetera, et cetera. There was also, um, and this is kind of a breakdown of what it was, and British policy, because of these camps and different power structure in Britain, sometimes the Arabists would sort of be making policy and sometimes the, the more pro-Zionists would be making policy. And it fluctuated over, these, over this period. And so it was confusing and it made it worse and it made, it, it made terrible problems, it made it, it made it very difficult for either side to understand what the British motivation really was or what their goals were, and made both sides distrust the British. So, go to the next. So we had, this is Europe in 33. I just wanna show, remind us a little bit about the horror that did happen there. We don't wanna, I don't wanna lose complete sight of that as we go into this. So, these are the numbers of Jews in this area, in these various countries, numbers of Jews living there, in 33, when Hitler comes to power, okay? So this gives you an idea. Eastern Europe, I mean, we have a total of 9.5 million Jews living in these areas, okay? So go to the next. This is Jews getting out, because they saw the writing on the wall, they wanted out. These are the Jews that were able to escape and to get to other countries and flee. You'll notice that not all of them fled to Palestine. <laughs> Most of them fled other places. 
America, other places, okay? They try to get out, Argentina. So this, this was happening, this, this massive uh, leaving. So go to the next. Now, in these countries, during the Holocaust, Poland, 85% of Jews were murdered. 82% Czechoslovakia, 81 Germany. 90% of the Jews in Lithuania were killed. This was the gravity of this. It was a complete depopulation. It was a genocide. Six million altogether. 72% of the Jews of Europe. So, go to the next. Now this is 1950. As you can see, the numbers are much smaller. So go to the next. So what happened was the British, so frustrated with the situation they were in and unable to affect anything, uh, created something called the Peel Commission in 1937. They got a bunch of people together and they created a new partition plan where they would come up with, uh, where they would give the Jews this little tiny piece and they would give a new Arab state, this other piece for the, pal the so-called Palestinian Arabs that were now kind of emerging as this population, and they would give, keep Jordan the way it was, and they would, it was all strange, it was, a, it was this very, very, it was even more truncated than this, what you're seeing here, and the Jews reluctantly accepted it, and the Arabs rejected it, because it was still giving the Jews too much, okay? So at that point, Britain said, we're done. And once the Peel Commission failed, and they even actually even decided they wouldn't support it either and for other reasons, political reasons, but they basically bowed out and they handed the mandate back to the newly formed United Nations. Okay? It had been the League of Nations, now it's the United Nations, America's in it, etc. It's handed back in 47. So in 47, the UN now takes this on and tries to do something not like Sykes Pico. They learn from Sykes Pico a little bit that you can't just draw lines. You have to think about who lives where, okay? So they looked at a map and they said, okay, the orange area here is where it's majority Jewish. The yellow area here is where it's majority Arab. So we're gonna divide it up like that. Does that look like something that's gonna last? <laughs> yeah, it didn't. So then, even now, even looking at this map, most of the Jews thought, okay, well, look, we got to start somewhere. It's a state. It, let's try it. This was sort of the reaction. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of fear they'd be, take, they'd be attacked, but they thought, let's try it. Um, this was sort of the uh, overarching idea. Jerusalem would be like an international city in this plan. So most Jews accepted the plan. There were certainly some outspoken critics, but most Jews, most Jews in, in this, in the, in the in in Palestine accepted it, and the Arab leadership, both the Arab leadership in this territory and all the surrounding nations rejected it because it was giving the Jews too much. We can't do it. A lot of that's that Husseini tradition of the Jews have to be eradicated. That was still becoming this dominant thread now uh, in the Palestinian Arab leadership, but even so, it was just more widespread even than that. Um, so Britain refused basically to try to even implement the plan because they could tell trying to implement this thing would be a military engagement with all sides and they didn't want that. And they, were, they had just barely escaped World War II. The entire country, they were broke and even broker than broke. And so they knew they couldn't, have, they didn't have the capacity to do anything like that. So they bowed out. And they basically gave it away and the mandate on of Britain was gonna end on May 15th of 48, officially just where just wind out, okay? The, leg the legality would end. So Israel decided to declare independence at that point, okay? So go to the next. So May 14th, day before the mandate expires, Israel declares independence. On May 15th, Arab declares to create a United State of Palestine, and Israel is invaded by all the surrounding nations, including Iraq, which had to go through Jordan to do it, okay? So if you see here, I know it's kind of hard to see, but all the green arrows here, all these green arrows along this line, that's all invading Arab armies, 
or forces. Army is a little bit too lofty a term. Some of these groups of people were 300 guys with pitchforks or something. Some of them were not. Some of them were tanks. Okay, it, it was a serious thing. I don't want to. I don't want to mock it, but in some places it was just it was just peasant farmers who were ordered to go take that hill type of thing. Um, so, but even so, it was a major major event. As you can see, this little sliver yellow part here. If I can get this working, this little thing here. That's what the state of Israel was. This little thing. Okay. That's what it was when they declared independence. Oh, and by the way, Harry Truman, President of the United States, was the very first to recognize the state of Israel. He actually named it on a communique given to him, handed to him, uh, against all of his cabinet, by the way. They all did not have him to do this. They didn't want him to weigh in at all. They thought the state would be immediately destroyed. Marshall, too. But he sat there and saw it, and it said, on the, on the telegram it said, a Jewish state, the, the independence of a Jewish state. And he marked that out and wrote, U.S. recognizes the state of Israel, which is the actual name today. So in some ways, Harry Truman named it, <laughs> named the country. So, but he was first. Uh, Soviet Union came very quickly behind, but the United States was first. So that made it real. And the Arab countries were infuriated by this recognition. So they invaded, and they lost. After three weeks of war, four weeks, this area now, this yellow area, is now what Israel has taken it, with its forces. And this area here, the West Bank and Gaza, is what the Arabs in that area still controlled, OK, after only a few weeks. OK, so it was a rout of the Arab invasion. And Israel took even more territory than they would have had in the original partition plan. Okay? Now, that was surprising to everybody, probably not least of which the Israelis themselves. Okay? They did not expect this kind, of a, this kind of a thing. They did not expect the Arab states to just crumble and the Arab armies to crumble, but they did. Why? Well, lots of different reasons. One, the Arab states could not agree. They weren't coordinating any of their attacks. They all had separate agendas. Everybody was trying to take their piece and hold it and keep it away from the other guy. Stuff like this happened all over. All, all five of those powers were not coordinating their attacks. The, um, the Arabs in country that were there were told to leave by their own leadership. They were told to flee. They were not told to hold ground or hold or dig in or anything. They were told to run away by their own commanders okay, and mayors and things like this. They were told to get out and you'll come back later. We'll come back later with, with more. We'll get them. Okay? This was this, the, the pitch that was given. And so by and large, many, many, many Arabs left by, based on that understanding that they would be coming back okay, of the Arabs of this area. Now, some, there were some battles. There were some serious battles. There were people that fled the war because of the war. I don't want to act like that didn't happen. Okay? Some of these people fled because they were forced out by fighting. Okay? But in many, many, many areas, I would say the majority of the areas, people left because they were told to leave. Okay? So it's, it's dual. There's two things happening there. So go to the next. So this is what we have. Just to reiterate this, we have this was the area that was going to be uh, before this, this part of Israel here. This was going to be Israel. Or this was going to be the Palestinian ter the new uh, Arab state. And this white area was going to be the state of Israel. Then they ended up with this. Okay, The West Bank here is the biblical Judea and Samaria. It's the biblical kingdom of Israel, almost, almost exactly. Okay, That was annexed by Jordan the next year. Just arbitrarily, we now own this. Okay, So for the next years, until 67, this was the norm. This became the norm. And the West Bank became part of Jordan. Gaza became part of Egypt, was controlled as part of Egypt. It was like a separate thing, but it was, it was controlled by Egypt. And this became the new normal for the next 15 years. So next slide. So at this time, we always hear about the Palestinian refugees, but I want to drive something home here. There was a lot more refugees than the Palestinian refugees. Okay? We have, yes, we have. Palestinian Arabs were driven out, fled to Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, West Bank, Gaza. They were not given citizenship, but kept in refugee camps until today, except in Jordan. Jordan did offer them citizenship at some point, but, and we'll get into that. But 
600,000 Jews were expelled and encouraged to leave Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and they, they left behind everything. They just had to go. Because if they didn't go, they were going to be killed. And they knew it. They left everything and, and left. Okay? And came to Israel with nothing. Okay? They would live in a tent for months. Even, they could have been a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. And they'd come to, they'd come to the new state of Israel as a Jew living in their own state for the first time, and they're in a tent for 10 months. So it was not easy. It was not, but every side was struggling here. Every side suffered. Okay? So go to the next. So this is kind of what happened to the, this is the Arab states encouraged Palestinian Arabs to leave their home temporarily in order to be out of the way of the armies. This is from a 1949 newspaper in Jordan. So I'm, that's not me just saying that. There's, it's out there. It's documented. And this is where they went, basically. You can see the percentages where they fled to. Again, major percentage, obviously, in the Gaza Strip and West Bank. West Bank, up until that moment, had been referred to in all maps everywhere by everyone as Judea and Samaria, and Jordan didn't want that, so they changed the name to West Bank, meaning West Bank of the Jordan River, to GD, just like the Romans had done previously, to take the Jewishness out of it. Okay. So go to the next. So all this uh, exacerbated over time. Um, all these places refused to grant citizenship to the Palestinians. There's a lot of actual, it, it's kind of a strange way to put it, but there actually is, it's even probably more pronounced now. But then as well, there was a racism of sorts between the surrounding nations, Arab populations, and the Palestinian Arabs. They were not seen as the same as the place they came. If, they, if you were Palestinian Arab, you were seen as low. You were seen as peasants by the surrounding Arab states in, in the majority of cases. And that, and that colored all the way they were handled and how they were treated. Only Jordan welcomed the Palestinians and granted them citizenship. And even today, Jordan is about 50, 45%, 50% Palestinian. Um, and based on the idea that Jordanians and Palestinians were both basically Arabs, and they both had brand new countries, so they should, they should try to get along, and that's, that's what they tried to do. It ended up backfiring, but uh, this is what they tried to do. And in 52, the UN set up this $200 million fund to resettle the refugees, but it was never used. And eventually it went toward starting this uh, UN Relief Works uh, organization that basically still exists to this day. So uh, Palestinian refugees are unique in the world in that they, even if they go in another country and settle, they are still considered refugees. And the descendants of those refugees are still considered refugees. It's the only people that is like that in the entire world. Every other people group that has refugee status is handled by the UN High Commission of Refugees, and they have a refugee status for one year, okay, by law. That's the it. This is a unique phenomenon. The Palestinians still to this day have refugee status legally because the descendants of the refugees are still refugees because the Arab states will not absorb them. And there's reasons for that. It's a lot of it's political, but we can talk about it. So go to the next. So this was the refugee conference in home Syria in 57. So we're moving ahead. But any discussion aimed at a solution of the Palestine problem, which will not be based on ensuring the refugees' right to annihilate Israel, will be regarded as a desecration of the Arab people and an act of treason. This is how serious the right of return became. It became the sine non for any negotiations, any discussions, anything. The refugees have to be allowed to come back and thereby demographically dilute this Jewish state or, or whatever it is into uh, a meaningless entity that would then be weakened and so on and so forth. So go to the next. So Jewish refugees, just to reiterate this one last time, about 600,000 settled in Israel were given citizenship. Another 300,000 sought refuge elsewhere, many of them in the uh, United States. Um, but 800,000 Jews were encouraged or forced to leave Muslim countries where their ancestors lived for up to 2,500 years in Iraq. They had lived there since the first exile. Okay. So since the first destruction of Solomon's temple, some of those Jewish communities were that old. And they were, they were all kicked out. So go to the next. So now we're going to look at 67 very quickly. Um, May of 18, or 18th May of 67, Egypt asks for the UN peacekeepers in the Sinai to be removed. This was a clear warning. 
uh, Sinai remilitarized, uh, was remilitarized by Egypt. All the tank divisions came back in. Um, they violated the Straits of Tehran, which was part of the Agreement of 56, and they uh, shut it to Israel shipping down at the bottom of the, right down here. They shut this down, which then blocks off this port, Elat, of Israel. It's its only uh, southern port. And uh, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria signed a military pact, and all their forces moved to the borders. And now Israel attacked <laughs> because they saw all this happening, and they preemptively attacked and destroyed the entire Egyptian Air Force in two days and a few other things. Go to the next. So, by the way, this is something before the actual thing happened. If Israel embarks on an aggression against Syria or Egypt, the battle will be a general one, and our basic objective will be to destroy Israel. This is President Nasser of Egypt before the war. The existence of Israel is an error, which must be rectified. This is an opportunity to wipe out the ignominy, which has been with us since 48. Our goal is clear to wipe Israel off the map, President of Iraq, two days before the war. So this, is where they, this was the mindset of the Arab states at that time. They wanted Israel gone. Next slide. June 5, Israel launches preemptive strike against Egypt and Syria. Jordan attacks Israel. June, Israel occupies Old City and West Bank. Uh, Israel captures the Golan Heights, and the ceasefire was signed on the 11th. In six days, Israel tripled its size. Okay? Now, it wasn't prepared for this. It had no idea this would go this way. It did what it wanted to do. Its Air Force was very good, but it had no idea it would be this successful. So it was caught off guard a little bit by the success. There was even a big debate, actually, between the commanders who were about to take the old city of Jerusalem. They were asking the home office, uh, the headquarters, do you really want us to do this? Are we supposed to do this? Are we going to do this? And there was this debate. There were hours went by while they debated about whether or not the Jews should actually take Jerusalem because the old city was still in Jordanian hands. So there was a bit, they eventually did it, and they did it, and the Jordanians just fled. They just, it was a very short battle. So... This is what Israel achieved in the Six-Day War. And not only this, but it was a massive, massive propaganda victory for Israel and a propaganda disaster for the Arab states. They had just been resoundingly crushed second time. So by a smaller country and presumably um, a Jewish state that didn't, had no right to be there to begin with, right? But here we are. Here's Israel again. So go to the next. So then we have... In 67 September, after this, in the embarrassment of this, the Arab states get together and they make the three no's. This was the famous three no declaration of three no's. Okay? The three no's was no peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, no negotiations with Israel. And this governed the Arab thought for, the, for decades. Okay? This was a very big deal when this happened. And that's why when Egypt does make a treaty, they're violating this. Right? They're violating the three no's. Okay? So, but here's, we'll go on to the next one. So, here's the expansion. Of, so now, J Israel occupies the West Bank. It is, it is very much a majority Arab area. And they occupy Gaza, which they didn't really want, but they didn't want anyone to have it as a bastion to attack them, so they had to, they had to control it. So these are the parts that they control. If you can see in 1948, that's the number of Jews living in the West Bank, 480. Okay. Uh, in 66, there's none, because those have been moved out. But in 72, there's 800, 700 in, the, in, the, in parts of the Jerusalem annexed in 67, 9,000. In 83, 22,000 in the West Bank, 900 in Gaza. 1993, 11, 11, uh, 111,000. 2004, 231,000. Right now, it's 300,000. Okay, so the, that, that movement took hold, the idea of, Jews moving back to the biblical lands of Samaria and Judea. Okay, that took hold. That, that resonated with a lot of the Jewish community, especially the religious, and they have moved back to that area in, in enormous numbers. So, go to the next. These were areas, some of the areas captured in the Six-Day War that are now uh, uh, deeply settled by, by Israel. Now, Gaza, of course, has been unsettled. So, Gaza, in 2005, was given back, basically, to the Palestinians in the sense that 8,000, um, between 8 and 10,000 Jews who had settled there were forcibly removed. They were invited to leave by the Israeli government, and then the ones who didn't leave were forcibly removed by the Israeli government. Why? 
because it was a disengagement plan by Ariel Sharon, who was prime minister at that time. He decided Gaza was impossible to secure and impossible to maintain as a Jewish enclave and should be abandoned. And so that's what was done in 05. We'll get to that, though. But I wanted to make the point that that's not still part of that. And then Sinai. There were actually settlements built in Sinai, also uprooted and given back in 79 when the, when the treaty was signed. So we'll go on to the next one. So in 73, we had the Yom Kippur War, where they launched a surprise attack, and they made progress. They punched into, into the area um, of, the, of the Sinai, and actually, uh, by, but by the end of the second week, Israel had fought back and retaken the territory. Again, Ariel Sharon was a part of this, was part of this uh, retaking. Um, and Israel basically pushed Syria out of the Golan completely uh, and counterattacked Egypt and the Sinai and actually pushed clear into Egypt proper across the, the Suez Canal and could have actually taken Cairo, okay? But basically we're told not to by the powers that be. So, uh, but it was a serious uh, war. It was a, it was a, it, it, it was a defeat. I don't want to make any bones about that. It was a defeat for Egypt, and it was a defeat for Syria, a, a very serious defeat for Syria. But it did an important thing for Egypt in that at that time, Israel, especially in the triumphalism that came out of 67, Israel did not really feel like they were any more threatened by the Arab powers. They did not feel threatened by Egypt. And from 67 to 73, they did not feel that threatened. They felt like they could handle it. From 67 to 70, there had been this war of attrition where, where Nasser, in the last years of his rule, had basically told his forces to continually fire into Sinai just to kill whoever you can kill. This is when Israel controlled the Sinai for those years. And it was known as the war of attrition. It didn't really do that much. It just annoyed Israel, but it also, it also actually betrayed the weakness of the Arab states and that they couldn't really do anything to Israel, that Israel was too strong and too resilient to be dislodged. And so all this, ha all this kind of dovetailed into this thing where Sadat, when he takes power in 70, Nasser dies and Sadat takes power. Um, Anwar Sadat was a general. He was part of the 73, I mean, part of the um, uh, 67 war. He fought in it. He remembered it. But he also decided that, you know, Israel doesn't take us seriously. And so he used these years from 67 to 73 to completely rearm and re-equip the military. He did it with help from the Soviet Union. And he, he did everything he could do to rebuild and reestablish the army, and especially like in, in armor and, and air force, things like this that they thought they could use on the ground in a Sinai, in a, in a retaking of the Sinai, okay? And it was very well planned, it was very well executed, and it was executed on the holiest day of the year for Israel, and so uh, Israel was caught off guard by it. And they did push, but what the, what the most powerful thing about it was is that... Uh, Sadat actually came out of it kind of a hero in Egypt, because, in the Egypt High Command, because he had achieved something in the sense that he had, they had shown Israel, we do have a war option. Yes, you beat us eventually, but we hurt you. And we, you'd rather be at the negotiating table with us than fighting us. This was kind of this, this thing. Now, this was very closely held, because again, the three no's. So the Egyptians didn't want the rest of the Arab states to know that they were sort of warming up to the idea of settling this border, okay? They did not want that to be widely known. This was something they were doing very much in the, in the back rooms and trying to get this done, trying to move for this, toward this, without revealing that they were willing to do it. And, and even then, they could have walked away at any point. But certain things came to pass. So we'll go to the next. So. By 77, Sadat, who's now been in power, he's now secure, he's now feeling secure, and he's now kind of writing the, and believe me, in Egypt, that entire war is still, to this day, taught as a victory. It's, it's taught that the Egyptians won, almost. I mean, or at least fought to a tie or something, you know. So, so uh, yeah, so I guess it's college football. Then. But, but, so they, so, but Sadat really used that to secure his place in Egypt. Now, he was... He did a lot of other things that were interesting and, and innovative. He actually let the Muslim Brotherhood have more control. He let the Islamists have a little more freedom, and that came back to haunt him. But he did do these things, and he allowed Islamists, Islamism in general to grow a little bit in the country instead of being massively suppressed like it had been 
under Nasser. And so he was seen as an innovator. He was seen as, as clever and smart and willing to try interesting things. And one of those interesting things was he basically broke off with the Soviet Union very early on in his, he, once, he'd re once he'd done his 73, he really ended the, the Soviet relationship and, got his, and, and, and walked away from that. And that was a signal to the West that, that I'm, I'm gettable. It was kind of his subtle way of saying that. And then in 77, he did this unbelievable thing when he basically accepted a off-the-cuff comment of he could come to Israel and speak into Knesset. And this was done by an Israeli premier who would said it basically not as a joke or anything, but not really expecting him to accept, and he did. <laughs> so Sadat came in 77, as you see there, him getting off the plane and waving, and that's, uh, uh, I can't think who was standing next to him at the moment, but, but and, they, and this, this began, this idea, and actually this is when President Carter gets involved. He starts to see this as real, and President Carter invites them in the, in later in 78, invites uh, Sadat and Begin to Camp David. They sit there for three weeks and hammer out this deal known as the Camp David Accords. The Camp David Accords were not a treaty, but they were the framework for a treaty. And the treaty came in the spring of 79. They actually were able to sign a treaty, and Egypt was able to sign an actual peace treaty with Israel. And this was the first thing. And this was in direct, direct contradiction to the three no's. Okay? And so Egypt was kicked out of the Arab League, it was ostracized by the Arab world, paid an enormous price, and in 81, Sadat was assassinated. Not only because of this, as I said, he did other things in, in, in country that caused him other issues, but this was part of it. And the Arab world was struck dumb by this. They never thought Egypt was the leading Arab state of the day, and for it to do this first was profoundly unsettling. And Egypt then became a Western-aligned power in the region. It, it, they, they started to get massive uh, U.S. support and things like this from, from that point forward. So it realigned Egypt in a way and realigned an entire section of the Arab world. Okay? This what le and Saudi was, was close behind. So go on the next. Then we have this thing. We're jumping ahead to, to really the Palestinian question. What happened in um, this time was we have the first time we start to see the Palestinian identity after 67, we really start to see the Palestinian people as a uh, personal identity where people, uh, Palestinian Arabs are calling themselves Palestinian. Okay, that's really post-67. Okay, in large part, there's little bits and pieces here and there you can find, but really it comes together in 67, where you start to have a Palestinian people self-identifying as a Palestinian people. Okay, and out of that, or just before 67, there had been this thing created called the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO. That was created in 64, and at that time, it was created when Jordan controlled the West Bank, okay, remember? And uh, the Gaza was controlled by Egypt, and so when the PLO was created, they specifically said, we do not want any control over the West Bank or Gaza. That's in the original Palestinian charter, okay? This was about the rest. Okay? This was about the Jewish state. This was about getting a state of, for the Palestinians right where Israel is. Okay? It wasn't about the West Bank and Gaza. That came later. Okay? So, but post-67, we suddenly have this emergence of the PLO as a, a major player for the Palestinians. And it's originally just a terrorist organization, flat out. That's what it is. But it becomes a revolutionary movement over time. And... By 87, it has become a powerful movement in the Palestinian people, and Fatah, which is Yasser Arafat's party, is the leading party of the PLO. There are many parties within it, but Fatah is the main leading party, and that is controlled by Arafat. So Arafat becomes the head of the PLO, and he begins to wage this, this war with Israel through terrorist acts and terrorism. And this begins in 87. Can you bring that slide back up? So this is the last part, yeah, so we'll just stay right here. So this intifada is what it's called. Intifada means uh, stirring up, okay, um, agitation. So this intifada that was orchestrated by Arafat to jar, really jar loose the Israelis, because the Israelis at that time were not looking to do a deal. They felt like they could sort of just occupy the West Bank and occupy Gaza in perpetuity, is the way it seemed. 
That's the way it felt. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to get in the heads of the Israelis. I'm just saying this is the way it seemed to the Palestinians, that there was no end game here. There was no political horizon. So this is what happened. They, they erupted into this, into, this, into this agitation, this intifada, and it came from the frustration of lack of progress towards any kind of settlement. There, the fact that Egypt and Jordan were now making treaties with, uh, with, the, with the Israelis, and all this was starting, and the Israel occupation was still there. I mean, it's still being occupied by Israel, Israeli forces, IDF forces in the West Bank, everywhere, in Gaza, everywhere. It was something that the Palestinian people was deeply humiliating, deeply embarrassing for them, and they couldn't, they couldn't go anymore. So Arafat was able to play, to, to sort of coalesce all this frustration into his movement. And also, yes, the, certainly, certainly the economy of the Palestinian territories was very bad. So all of this played into the frustration of the moment. And all this led to this kind of spontaneous uprising that Arafat was able to seize control of and, and make use of. And it went on for years. It went on for six years. Okay? But it did several things. It actually did. It, it cost a lot of lives. Is there one more slide after this? What's the next one? Yeah. So just leave it here. So we had 1,600 Palestinians killed, 241 children, hundreds of informers killed by the militia, people who were telling Israel information, um, 160 Israelis killed. Lots of those were, you know, terrorist attacks on, on a car going by or something or a, terror, a bomb in a, in a pizzeria, that kind of thing. Um, but it actually really embittered the Israeli-Palestinian relations, but it actually empowered Palestinian self-identity. It made them feel like they were doing something. They were getting noticed. They were being heard. Okay? And so it grew. Israel was criticized in the international community in a serious way because it's very difficult to put something like this down, and so it ends up being violent, and it ends up being harsh. And that was all playing out on CNN. So it damaged both economies, especially the tourism, just basically disappeared. But it did lead to this Madrid conference where, and the Oslo Accords, we'll talk about Oslo next. We're going to stop here and do questions. But, but the Madrid conference was important because Madrid was actually about something else. It was about Syria and Egypt and other things. But what happened at Madrid was the Palestinian, the PLO, was recognized by all the Arab states as the sole representative of the Palestinian people. This had to actually happen, even, even though that offended the Israelis because the PLO was a terrorist organization to them, but it actually was a necessary step because until you have a sole representative of the Palestinian people, you can't negotiate anything. So it was one of those things that it was, it was very difficult for Israel to accept this, this, this new designation. It took them a while to get around that, but they, they understood in the end that this had to happen, that you had to have a sole representative, someone who could sign the document. Okay. If you don't have someone who can sign the treaty, you can't make a treaty. If you don't have someone with the authority to sign the treaty, the treaty is meaningless. If you don't have someone that can deliver on the treaty, the treaty is meaningless. So if you're going to get a treaty with the Palestinians, they have to have a leadership that you can actually address. So that's what came out of this, the Madrid conference, and then we're going to go to Oslo. But I'm going to stop here, um, and we'll do some questions. question. Can you help me understand again why the Palestinians in particular are the refugees that are never um, let go of that status? How that happened? Well, that's a big debated question. Um, but I will say that uh, a lot of it's political. Um, it, some, well, I'll, I'll say some of it. Let's say I'm not going to give percentages. I'm going to say here are the problems. One problem, it's political. The Arab states don't want to solve the Palestinian problem. They want the Palestinian pressure they want the pressure of the Palestinian problem on Israel. They don't want that to go away. They want it to remain. Now, that's kind of a 10-year-ago answer, okay? It's still there. There's still that part that they don't want to, that the Arab states never wanted to solve the Palestinian problem because they wanted the Palestinian problem to be Israel's problem, okay? So that's part of it. But the other part of it is the Palestinians themselves, their own leadership, also didn't want to solve the problem because they never believed they couldn't win. The Palestinian leadership, even today, well, maybe not today, but up until very recently, the Palestinian leadership still thinks it can somehow destroy Israel. I would say even five years ago, this was still something they clung to as a future possibility. Okay? It's, it seems a little bit ludicrous, but the reason I say that, and I know that, and also, again, part of this is political, but the Palestinian people, cradle to grave, are never 
ever taught to accept the state of Israel as faith accompli. Never. They're taught to accept it as temporary. They're taught to accept it as something that's a mistake that'll go away someday. And often they're taught a lot worse than that. But we'll leave that aside. Okay? Most part in the generic secular education such as it exists in Palestinian territories today, Israel is not taught as a permanent thing. Maps of Palestine are the entire map of Israel in textbooks. Okay? Uh, clubs are, are, in the summer clubs, you're taught to, you know, pray for the annihilation of, of Israel and things like, I mean, it's just, it's just still, there's still this deeply rooted refusal to admit Israel's going to be there. It's just not part of it. And so one person's put it this way that I always think about this. It's not this simple, but this is a, in every, every, you know, they would say every complex problem has a really simple wrong answer. So this isn't the answer, but I'm saying that it is amazing how if you took, this was a letter to the editor in the Chicago Tribune. If every Palestinian laid down their weapons right now, there'd be no more violence and they'd have a state in a few weeks. If every Jew laid down their weapons right now, they'd have no more Israel and in two weeks they'd be dead. Okay, so that's a that's an educational problem. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. Sure. Um, my first question was just about uh, the military strength of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much every time you've discussed it, um, they're able to overcome or overpower. So I was wondering right. what the basis of it is. Is it sure. biblical, scriptural? <laughs> um, I like, the, I like that answer. Um, <laughs> like, where is it cultural? Right. Is it just something? And why is it so, so? Why is there such a disparity? And then the second sure. part, if you have time, is just that: um, what is the footprint of Britain and France and the United States in the Middle East right now, okay. as far as financially? Is it okay. going towards weapons, or is it going towards humanitarian okay. efforts? Right. So, first question. Um, how did Israel get to be this mil great military power? Uh, it was part of their uh, raison d'etre from the very beginning. The first kibbutzim and the first uh, moshavs that were built, the first little settlements that were built, were built almost as uh, walled enclaves. I mean, they knew they were going to be attacked. They knew they were going to be hated. They knew they were gonna, that the, all the surrounding areas were going to come after them. And th it only got worse. I mean, they, they knew this, and they prepared and so in 48, when they won this enormous uh, victory, and the Arab states couldn't figure out how, it's because they'd been preparing for it for 20 years. They knew it was coming. They just didn't know when. And so all the little uh, Jewish enclaves were extremely well armed, uh, running guns out of Czechoslovakia through World War II and even, and even later. But they were prepared for something. They didn't know what it was going to be, they did, but they knew they were going to be attacked. They knew it was going to be fierce. They knew it was going to be from all sides. They knew every little town was going to have to defend itself. It wasn't going to be able to necessarily help the town over there because there was going to be something in between. It didn't turn out to be as bad as they thought, but they were prepared for the worst. And so I think that's what really took, I think that's really what you can look at all along. You look at it in 48, and it was the Jewish people were completely prepared, over-prepared. The Arabs were completely unprepared and had no uni unity of mission or message. The Jews were very unified in mission and message, survival. Okay, they just come out of the Holocaust. Okay, so that drove it. Then from, from 48 to 67, you had a very fragile state of Israel. Yes, they'd won this war in 48, but they were tiny and they were surrounded on all sides. And some of the, and Syria and Egypt had big armies. So they were afraid. And so the, it was fear. And, they, and they, I'd say half the national uh, budget was defense through that entire period. Again, what did they do? They went for quality over quantity. They're small, okay? Don't buy the L-29 trainer, buy the A-4s. <laughs> you know, buy the thing that can actually do the job. Do, get the thing you need to do the job. And so there was, they, they, would do any, they would buy anything, but they would always try to have some of the best stuff. This was a goal, okay? A little bit maybe, but they would pay a little more and get the higher quality weapon, instead of having a truckload of RPGs, they would have one really good tank, 
okay? And for them, that was better. And this was very much part of the, the psyche of the army all the way through. Plus, Israel made some very serious decisions early on. A very famous one is the Altalina, where there was a shipload of weapons coming in to Tel Aviv, full of weapons that they could use for the, for the independence war. But the group who owned that ship was not taking orders from the central command of the Israel Defense Force, okay? And the ship was sunk. It was a whole truck shipload of weapons sunk right off the coast by Israel because that fighting force was not fi following the chain of command. This was the type of thing Israel could do and would do because they knew that's what it took to build a country and to build a, a unified fighting force, one gun. So that's governed there, and it has never governed the surrounding Arab states. Yeah. And then the second part was, I'm sorry. Just the footprint of the Western oh, yeah. oral Right history. now, the British and French footprint is negligible, um, definitely aid, uh, aid to Syria, Lebanon, things like this. It's all aid. And the United States footprint in the Middle East is, is diminishing, but still quite large. Two is carrier groups at any given moment. Do we give them money for, does any of that military strength come from U.S. support? We give, we give Egypt and Israel, uh, we give Egypt $1.5 billion per year, and we give Israel $3 billion per year. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And Jordan about a billion. Yeah, yeah. And all that's military, by the way. Yeah. yeah, I have a question uh, about the Palestinian refugees. You said that with the exception of Jordan, that the Arab countries have treated badly mm -hmm. these refugees and their descendants. Um, so I'm wondering whether uh, uh, the rest of the world, uh, like the United States, Europe, uh, Canada, Australia, should then offer to resettle these refugees in their countries, uh, I would have thought that notwithstanding the pipe dreams of some Palestinians right. to return to Israel, that many of them would be happy to have a, yeah. a home somewhere else. Right. It's true, and they can do that. I mean, there's, a lot, there's, there's lots of Western countries that have, are open to Palestinians becoming citizens of that country, but to do that, you have to give up your refugee status. And for them, for many of the Palestinians, that is an actual, like it's a it's a badge of honor, if you will. It's, a, it's an important part of their identity, and they don't want to give it up. So a lot of the non-assimilation is a choice. And now it's become like a patriotism thing. Not for, not for all Palestinians. Don't, don't, don't pretend that all of them think the same. The Palestinians are not monolithic any more than the Israelis are, but, or the Americans, for that matter. But I think that uh, there is a real reluctance in the Palestinian community, again, by based on education. They are told this. They are taught that you shall not give up your refugee status. You are betraying the people, you know, to do this. It's, it's part of the culture. Now, I think that's fading a little over the last 10 years. That doesn't resonate like it used to. Uh, now we have Twitter. <laughs> now we have Facebook. They can, get on, they can get on the Internet and find out for themselves what's going on in the world. So it's, it's not as monolithic as it used to be. But for a long time... It's been very difficult for the Palestinian people to get the truth of their situation and to get their full options explained to them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <coughs> Evie Isles, tailgating off of his question, um, why wasn't the, or there was an area that you said during the Israeli wars or something like mm -hmm. that, that there was an area that was given back? Um, why was, or was it ever thought to make that a homeland or a, s a spot for Palestinians? Right, so this has always been there. Look, I mean, the, the West Bank, and in, we're going to get to this in a minute, the West Bank and Gaza as an as a entity um, have been offered many times, or several times throughout the peace process we're going to get into now, as a Palestinian state with nearly full autonomy with the idea that, no, you can't have uh, advanced weaponry that could threaten the state of Israel, but you can have whatever else. You can have an army, you can have a, poli a serious police force, you can have these things, and you can have full governing authority over your, st over your territory. Things like this have been offered, and they've been refused. Okay. Not usually based on not getting this full sovereignty thing or not being able to have whatever they want, but because they would have to, at the same time, accept the state of Israel. Mm -hmm. okay. 
So you, we have to get to the point where the Palestinian people, top down, not just one part or this part, because at any time you can find people that would agree. Okay, there's plenty of Palestinians that would take a deal tomorrow. But you have to get top down buy in to the idea I want my state more than I want to destroy Israel. I want Palestinian independence more than I want Israel's destruction. And at the moment, we do not have a plurality of Palestinians believing that concept. Okay. And the, my next question was, is Israel a, is it understood that Israel is a home for Israelis and as far, or Jewish people as far as citizenship? Is it you know, only for them and no. not for people? Okay. No. Uh, so, Arabs in Israel have full citizenship. 12 Arabs currently serve in the Knesset, the parliament. Um, there's an Arab sitting on the Supreme Court of Israel. Um, it's, it's a pluralistic society. Okay, in 1999, Miss Israel was Arab. Okay, I mean, this stuff happens. Um, now, it's not perfect. I'm not here to tell you Israel's perfect any more than I would, or, or has race relations worked out any more than I would tell you America has race relations worked out. Okay, but I will say that uh, it's profound in uh, w what Israel has been able to achieve with a, a level of equality um, amongst, amongst the rights. Put it this way, Arabs in Israel have greater guaranteed rights by law than Arabs in any other state in the world, even all the Arab states. Okay? Israeli Arabs are more free than Arabs anywhere else, guaranteed by law. Yeah, go ahead. My name is Jane Cotton. Um, do you think that the Israelis could have taken over the uh, country, the, the part of the country that was occupied by Palestine without the aid of the Western world, such as Britain, France, and the United States? Um, I would say yes to 48 and 67. Both those wars were fought primarily by Israel using its own resources. In 73, um, they would have survived the conflict, but it would have been much, much harder for Israel to have done it without us. Um, we did resupply them late. We resupplied Israel late, maybe, maybe resupplied their ammunition and stuff like this late in the, in the conflict, but that did allow them to sort of have this another surge toward the end, and it shortened the war. Would Israel have won in 73? Yes. But it would have been longer, it would have cost more, it would have been, it would have been more protracted and our help helped shorten the war. So that's how I would put it, yeah. Hello, I'm uh, Joshua Reed, and the um, thing I'm sort of confused about is that um, during like World War II, you said that the Pal Palestinians called themselves Arabs, but now they call themselves Palestinians. So is their existence as a culture, is it like, based on the fact that Israel exists as a nation, is that how they come into be, like, you know, came into being? Or right. is, would it well, be fair to say they're like an artificial culture, or not artificial, but they were created right. because Israel exists? Yeah, it's not artificial. Um, the, the Arab culture of that region was there, okay? There was an Arab culture that was there. Um, but I will say this. Yes, it is true, it is very true, factually true, that until 48, Arabs in Palestine did not call themselves Palestinians. Palestinian was a Zionist term. It was actually used derogatorily by the members that came to the Peel Commission. Remember I talked about the 1937 Peel Commission. Okay, the Arabs that came to that denounced the word Palestine as a Zionist creation that should not be utilized, should not be used. Um, so it was definitely, a, a ne it had a negative uh, impact then, but what happened was with 48 and then 67, the Palestinian people ended up being not created, but defined by being the Arabs that were not the other states' Arabs, okay? And they did have a unique culture because Palestine is a unique place. So there's certainly things about Palestinian Arabs that are unique to them, and they have a family's connections and tribal connections that are unique to them. But we've noticed, as we've seen this separation with Gaza and and you know, the West Bank, over time, that Gaza has developed its own sort of culture and West Bank has a different culture. And, they, and there's not a lot of intermarriage between the two and such things. 
So these things happen once the borders are drawn. There's an organic, not creation, but defining. And so I would say, yes, there were, the Arabs of Palestine had a culture, but it became more and more defined by these wars. And so, yes, I will say this too, just to put this out there, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that had Israel lost any of these wars, there would be no Palestinian people today. They would all have been incorporated into the surrounding Arab states. There would be no Palestinian culture whatsoever. So in that sense, you're right, in the sense that the Palestinian identity has been allowed to form because of Israel's success. Otherwise, the Arab states, Jordan, Egypt, Syria would have just divided up and cobbled up all the land. That, and there would have been nothing about Palestine, anything. That would have remained a Zionist term. Yeah. Okay, go. Okay, go ahead. We still have another section, so, okay, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, how you doing? My name is Moses Sibbo. My question is, uh, as a black American and a black Christian, if I'm in that area of Jordan, uh, Israel, or Palestine, how would I be perceived? Um, what, you know, how would they look upon me? As we look upon like an Israeli person that comes over here, you know, what would be their cultural view of myself? Who's the they in the sentence? Well, the they would be the people that occupy the area, the, the, the locals. Well, it would depend on where you are. I mean, I don't mean to dodge your question. I'm not, I promise. It's just that uh, you walking around Jordan would be different than you walking around the West Bank or you walking around Jerusalem in the Jewish area would be different than you walking around uh, the Arab area. Everybody's going to have a different reaction to you. If they see you first and foremost as an American, then their reaction is going to be based on that. If they see you first and foremost as an African American, they're going to react based on that. There's probably not going to be too much reaction in any of the places I've described. They're just going to be assume you're a tourist. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, that's going to be their first reaction, right? I mean, All right. Um, and then it depends. I mean, if you took some, if you were there and you took some kind of political stand, then okay, you're going to generate a reaction, you know. But until you do, until you insert yourself into the dialogue uh, or the debate, they're going to, you know, hope you have fun in the old city and, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's okay. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Fraser Walton, and I was wondering if. Sorry. No problem. I was wondering if you could comment on the contribution of, of Dr. Ralph Bunch uh, to the settlement of the conflict back in the 1950s. Uh, yeah, Ralph Bunch is a personal hero of mine. He's an amazing man, uh, amazing, courageous man. I don't know enough about him, as much as about him as I'd like, but I do know that uh, he was instrumental in reversing uh, a UN definition of Zionism as racism. He was instrumental in that. He was instrumental in, in defending, basically, Israel's right to exist and Israel's right to be there. So I think he, is, he played an enormously important role. Um, and he was outspoken in his defense of Israel, defense of the Jewish people to have their own nationalism. It wasn't racism. Um, I think he was actually a very key player at a very important time. If he had not been there, I'm not sure some of those things would have been rectified. He, it, was, it was almost vital that it was coming from a civil rights authority for some of that to be achieved, I think, at the UN. He was an unimpeachable uh, civil rights authority, so when he was arguing civil rights, who was going to challenge him kind of thing? He had a gravitas in that role that it was um, fortuitous. <laughs> I look at that as one of those God things, uh, the right man at the right time in the right place. Uh, for something very, very crucial. Yeah. yeah. So we're done. We're going to take a five minutes. Okay, five-minute break. Only five. We'll come back in at 11.